start us off? Yes, I can. Well, I'm going to finish chewing the bite of food I just put in and then I can. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. Cool. All right, we'll start letting folks in. Hello, welcome folks that are just coming in. We're just starting to let people in, so we're gonna give it a couple minutes, um, but welcome. And if you'd like, we can use the chat function to put your name and where you're Zooming in from. It's always nice to see who's on the call. <clears throat> and we'll get going in just a minute or two. We've got a few new people coming in. Good morning. Welcome. We're going to get started in just a minute. Um, we're just asking people to say hello and put name and where you're zooming in from in the in the chat. <clears throat> what do you think, Laura? Are you still seeing people coming in or should we get going? I think we should get going. We've got a lot <laughs> to cover today and we'll just yeah. let folks in as they come. Okay. Excellent. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Jenna Koloski. I'm the Community Engagement and Policy Director with the Vermont Council on Rural Development. And this is the VCLN workshop on locally led community resilience efforts. Um, the VCLN stands for the Vermont Community Leadership Network. Um, we are a network of about 3,000 um, community leaders, members, nonprofit leaders from all around the state. Um, that are getting things done in towns um, around Vermont and statewide. And the idea is, and this actually started um, during COVID, we found that people were really eager to connect virtually, to come together, to learn about topics and themes that were important to the work they were doing, but also connect um, for some peer learning and learn together and from each other. Um, so we started a leadership network and we've been offering several workshops a year, as well as cohorts um, focused on different topics and um, on and then uh, kind of opportunities to connect and have open conversations as well. Um, interestingly, this workshop on uh, resilience efforts was scheduled well before uh, the flooding <laughs> impacted Vermont. Um, and so we kind of held on to this one knowing that it was more important than ever to continue this conversation, but also added in some community conversations focused on flood recovery efforts that have been going on over the past several months. So. Um, Keep an eye out for emails coming up um, to let you know how we plan to continue these conversations and future workshops that we'll, we'll add. But for now, um, really the idea behind this workshop was to look at the efforts that communities and regions are taking around the state to um, become stronger, more resilient, um, to withstand future uh, flooding and other events that we might see um, coming to Vermont. And so, um, Laura, who I'm going to turn it over to in a moment, is our Climate Economy Program Director, and she's been um, really wanted to showcase some examples of communities doing this work and then open it up for a conversation to hear from you all questions you might have or things you might be working on your own communities. So that's the goal today. I'm excited to hear from our panelists, and I'll turn it over to Laura to introduce them and to get started. Thanks, Laura. Great. Thanks, Jenna, for that general overview of um, how we got to where we are today. Um, thanks again for joining. I'm going to, let's see, add a spotlight. So we're all together here. Um, so for the, the structure of the time together today, the first hour will be hearing from our panelists and some moderated conversation. Please stay on mute and put any questions that you have in the chat. And then the second half, we'll, we'll pause for folks who do need to jump off at 11. And then 11 to 11.30, we'll have an open conversation um, with the panelists and with, with you all. So thanks again for being here. And really as an introduction to, to the topic, um, I wanted to start off by saying there is such a big spectrum of what it means to be a resilient community. And we're just going to begin to explore that today. 
um, through social structures, physical infrastructure, watershed adaptation, to how to be prepared and anticipate these more frequent and higher volume climate events. Um, and to start off, community, if there's many different definitions of what community can be. Uh, one of those is a unified body of individuals, such as people with common interests living in a particular area, or a group of people with common characteristics or interests living close together or within a larger society. So that's really how we're thinking about community um, and it could be place-based, very place-based, watershed-based, um, or even state. There's many different communities that, that live within um, the, the broader state as well. And then thinking about resilience. And oftentimes we think that this is uh, the ability to bounce back or to respond. Um, but really there's one definition I've come across that I, I hold on to, and it's the capacity to withstand or to recover quickly from difficulties. So it's also that ability to be proactive in the way that we're thinking about um, future future potential events, but also building building what we have um, currently to support that development of community and uh, connectedness. So a little bit of the challenge, I would say, is in response mode is that ad hoc cycle of how to um, get things happening, but not delay the deployment or cause burnout um, or redundancy of efforts uh, or, or addressing that lack of access to basic needs and or outreach and information dissemination. But a resilient community has that opportunity of that built understanding and connection already in place. So ideally can respond quicker to the everyday, or to the, the catastrophes that come along, but really the everyday um, social cohesion too, to make a community thrive. Um, and our rural nature of the state is another interesting aspect that we'll get into today of how does that look in these small towns and in broader regions and in watersheds? And we often lack a, a central place to build those connections and to build community and resilience efforts. And so we're gonna to hear towards some ideas uh, towards, towards making that um, an asset for communities that can bring together different services or investments, um, bring together volunteers and other, other support within that. So a lot of challenges that the, face, the state is facing now, including uh, energy burden, access to heating and cooling centers, broadband connectivity, healthy and affordable foods, transportation options, uh, well-compensated work. And all of these efforts really stem around that ability to work collectively and across silos uh, to become a community that is all-inclusive and yet is able to respond and creatively move forward in our, in our future. So with that really broad, broad overview, I want to introduce our panelists today. So we have Mindy Blank, the co-director for Community Resilience Organizations. We have Marie Caduto, who's a watershed planner with the Department of Environmental Conservation. And we have Sam Lash, the climate and energy planner, Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission. And we have Sean Trader, who's the executive director of the Rainbow Bridge Community Center in Barrie. So I have an immense task for all these folks in that each could probably speak for hours, if not days, on the topic of community resilience. And I've given them 10 minutes. So each panelist will kind of share for 10 minutes and then we'll we'll do some additional follow-up Q&A and then open it up to you all. So to start, the prompt is really for each panelist to share what a resilient community looks like um, and what does that encompass and how do we get there? So with that, I would love to hand it over to Mindy. There we go. My computer is doing wonky things. Hey, everybody. It's really nice to be here with you. Thank you, Laura and Jenna. Um, I, I want to give you permission to direct my course if I get way off course um, in these 10 minutes. But um, yeah, as, as Laura mentioned, I am the co-director of Community Resilience Organizations. I co-direct this nonprofit with Jess Laporte. And, um, you know, 
I, as I was thinking about this, this panel today, I was reminded of something that happened a couple days after the flood. Um, and I live in Barrie and Barrie was very impacted as we know, and um, as well as many other places in the state. But I, I was, I, I stopped at Fox Market in, in the Plainfield area a couple days after the flood. And, and a friend and colleague, Murphy Barney was outside Fox Market and she was there with um, with art materials, art supplies, and uh, she was inviting people to come and draw a picture or to just um, talk if they needed to and to be there. And, and we were hugging and she said to me, we are in the most climate resilient county in the nation. And uh, this is a this is a fact. This is a statistic that I often share. That in Vermont we are we have six of the ten top counties in the entire country that are projected to have some of the least harsh impacts of the climate crisis. And that does not mean that we don't have harsh impacts because we do. We know we do. But that means that there are so many other places that are experiencing harsher impacts of the climate crisis. And so what what my work has focused on and, and a big ethos umbrella of community resilience organizations has been on focusing on how to how to create a place of climate refuge. And climate refuge does not just mean ecologically that we are projected to have less harsh impacts of climate change. It doesn't just mean that that ecological piece, it really means the social factors um, to create a place that is welcoming to people and to create a place that where the people who are presently here can thrive and where we can be welcoming climate refugees here. So to me, that means creating alternative systems to the dominant systems that don't work for majority of people um, and definitely don't work for frontline communities, the people who are most impacted by the climate crisis. And frontline communities are, are people who are um, already the most marginalized in our society. And, and in Vermont, there are also people who uh, sometimes don't know that they are part of frontline communities um, living in living in floodplains or or living in a place where there are oil tanks buried under the ground and near their homes, and they don't know that. Um, so frontline communities encompass a lot of different types of people, but our focus with community resilience organizations really has been on lifting up frontline communities of people who have been traditionally most marginalized. So, you know, as as we work on and try to build climate refuge, and as we work on trying to create alternative systems, what that means is is, is deep mutual aid, deep community care. Um, that also means setting up our basic needs differently. That means uh, food hubs and robust local food systems that actually feed local people, not just growing local food for local economy purposes and sending that food far away, but actually having that here to feed people. Um, that means, uh, you know, that means a lot of things and it is localized um, in terms of meeting our basic human needs. And in Vermont, we often, you know, we get into this little Vermont bubble where we're like, this is everything. <laughs> this is our place. This is everything. And we have to hold the global picture simultaneously, particularly as we're working on climate crisis. And so that means, you know, that means opening up this place to climate refugees. And there's a difference between climate refugees and climate immigrants. Climate refugees are people who are forced to flee where they are living, forced to flee their homes, and they will never be able to return. Um, and, and that is a deeply traumatic situation to be in. Um, and, and often, as we know, climate crisis exacerbates um, exacerbates impacts of war and famine and, you know, these other really, really pressing life situations. Um, those are climate refugees, um, often people of the global majority who are already the most marginalized within, within our society. Um, 
climate immigrants are people who are making an active choice to move to a, a place that feels safer to them. And they have they hold privilege to be able to make that decision to choose to um, to move to a safer place rather than being forced. And those two um, those two categories of people, climate refugees and climate immigrants, that encompasses climate migration. And I believe that climate migration is the greatest impact of climate change in Vermont um, and the greatest impact to be tackling. So how do we do that? <laughs> you know, it's a it's a lot to hold. Um, and also, you know, I I see a lot of this work as, you know, tearing down some of the systems that don't work while simultaneously building up these other systems that can work better. I feel a lot of hope in that. And <clears throat> And so it's, you know, it's about creating a new world. <laughs> so when I think about, you know, this prompt of who, you know, who are who are the communities that we're that we're working for? Um, frontline communities are the communities that community resilience organizations is working for right now. And we made we made a pivot years ago in about 2019 where previously we had really been focusing on communities as geographic locations or like people within a geographic location within a town, that that's a community and we're working on helping those communities build up resilience and build up these alternative systems. And now where we've been at over the past four or five years has really been focusing on helping frontline communities be empowered to design their own solutions, to design mechanisms that work better for them. And whether or not the climate crisis was happening or whether we were living in a different world and it wasn't happening, we would still have frontline communities of people who were marginalized in our society. Uh, and, and so working with frontline communities and, and like deeply embedded in that work is, um, is I feel like getting at some of these root issues and looking at the climate crisis. I don't believe that uh, that we can solve solve it just by all means, all means necessary. Because if we are continuing to harm the people who have been most marginalized, we are not doing the work, and we are not creating a better, a better, more just future to live in. Um, so a lot of the community work that we engage in kind of happens underground um, and it's not sponsored by a nonprofit. It's not a program. Uh, we are, however, figuring out more about how to use our nonprofit container to fill a specific niche within the climate movement. And so what, something that we've been really focusing on is reducing barriers to entry for frontline climate justice projects. And we assist with the bureaucracy so that the innovation can flow. Because as we know, people who are doers and dreamers are not often the best at doing the administrative work. And, and our, our minds all think differently. And people who are really dreaming into a different future like, you know, are not necessarily great at filling out paperwork and using spreadsheets and expense tracking and all of that. And so community resilience organizations have been holding that sort of admin administrative hub for a lot of really innovative climate justice projects happening on the ground, really doing that, um, that baseline, like hand to hand um ground work of creating alternative systems or creating different systems that actually work for their communities. So we see this admin piece as as a, as part of our niche in the climate justice movement. Um, we're also, you know, and uh, there's a lot of work that is underground, but a lot of it is above ground too. And it's all culture change work. And we think about it as as culture change work and shifting that social dial uh, um, when we can. And so we work in nonprofit sector change, pushing the edges of this container and what's possible, um, operating not as a standard nonprofit. Uh, we work in philanthropy sector change to really push for wealth redistribution as a form of systemic reparations and resourcing frontline communities. 
um, and we work in policy sector change, really pinpointed policy sector change to set an enabling environment for a more just future. So an area that community resilience organizations has really zeroed in on over the past several years has been land access um, and you know, co-creating and advocating for and being part of legislation um, that enables land access for most marginalized communities. Um, the 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 flood that I think I think my time is almost up here. Is that true? Is that true, Laura? Yeah. Okay, I'll say one last thing and be done. Um, right. In the in the flood response something that really struck me was how much we're learning. And it felt it felt really hopeful to me, actually, because we are, our default is to mutual aid now. Like we really got to practice during Tropical Storm Irene. We really, really got to practice during COVID, um, even in isolation. And we got to see some of the fruits of that in this particular flood where mutual aid just popped up right away. And so I feel really hopeful about that culture change that's happening. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Mindy. That was so much information. And like I said, we could hear hours on it. And thank you for touching on just the little bits that you are doing. And we look forward to hearing more. Um, so with that, uh, Marie, can you... Sure. Hi, I'm Marie Levette Caduto. I'm one of five watershed planners for the Department of Environmental Conservation. So we're all over the state. And first, I want to say thank you, Mindy, for talking about climate migration. I think it's probably one of the biggest issues where Vermont is facing over the next decade or more. So it's a really important topic for us to be working on. But I'm coming at this from kind of the, the, the other end of the, the resiliency spectrum, and that's the, the landscape scale, the, the infrastructure end of it, what we're doing on the landscape and, and what that's doing to our, um, our communities and our environment, basically. So when, when I think about what a resilient community is, I think on that entire watershed scale, on that landscape scale, and I'm, if I have a vision for what it needs to be, it's that as we work over the next several decades is what it's going to take to minimize the damage that happens when we have these flooding events. So how do we go about managing the landscape so this doesn't repeatedly impact our communities the way it's doing now. So how how we manage our rivers and streams to give them the room they need to be a natural system and to function in a natural way that doesn't do damage. That our, our stream banks and lake shores have vegetation on them that protects the rivers, it protects the people, it protects the community. And so that we're not always impacted and harmed by every time we have a flooding event. You know, when you're working on a, a landscape scale, it's a long-term view and it has to be because these aren't things that are that that we can do. We have a response now in recovery, but we have a long-term responsibility to make sure we don't repeat the things that we're constantly doing right now. So increasing that resiliency, you know, I look at the landscape not from a town level or a parcel property level, but on a watershed scale. So all the land that is draining down into any particular river or stream. And that, that's the level that's going to, in the long term, protect us from the floods. So when you know when you look at that, that requires the entire watershed community to be be at the table and participate and understand what what those changes can do for us in the long haul. Yeah, you know, we have programs that that provide funding for this. We as watershed planners identify those things that we can do on the landscape. We have clean water funding that can pay for the projects. We work with other agencies like Vermont Emergency Management where we have the resources to work through 
the issues and get the work done on the ground. So I, I find it really encouraging that, you know, I'm looking at things that happened during Tropical Storm Irene and where we've made changes in the landscape that it worked. And I'm gonna show you some pictures of that in a bit. But, you know, when I think about supporting communities kind of in that long-term recovery and resilience, what the communities need from, from my perspective is that long-term understanding. Like, it's not easy to connect something on that broad a scale to what's happening in my backyard. You know, why did my house get flooded? Why are we, why are we in this situation? And we have to broaden the view to take in that whole landscape and say, it happened 20 miles away from you and you were that frontline house. You know, you were, you are that frontline community um, that re that the impacts reach in the end. So getting that perspective out there, I think we have a lot of education to do um, to, to bring people to the understanding of why they need to be involved in this. I look at um, some of the other states. One of the questions Laura proposed is what, what do you see happening around you in other states? And I'm really encouraged to see, to look at some things that they're doing in Massachusetts our mapping of where we have flood hazards is woefully inadequate. You may have heard this on the news lately. We're working with maps from the 1970s in most places, and it does not reflect what our current climate is and what our current flooding situation is. And I mean, think about the, the amount of development that's happened since 1970 um, in our villages and along our rivers and streams. So we have moved into our watersheds in a very big way. So, you know, making that understanding, I'm watching Massachusetts and, and their new mapping is not driven by floods. And it's, you know, they're looking at sea level rise, which isn't the problem we have here, but it's, it's identifying where things should and shouldn't be. And what I'm excited about is that it's not coming from the government it's coming from industry that they don't want to put their new facilities. They don't want to make investments in locations that are predicted to be underwater or predicted to be flooded in the future. They want their investments to last. And I find that really encouraging that it's reached the level of industry and insurance that people are aware that climate change is happening and we have to deal with it. I think that's that's a really important step that that kind of we've taken all over the place. But what I want to show right now is the things, basically the things we've done right here. Um, since Irene, some of the changes and the projects that we've made that we got right. So I'm going to hopefully be able to share my screen here in just a second. Do this first. A second, you always got to find your right screen here. And I'm hoping you can all see this. So what we do as watershed planners is find places on the landscape to make changes that are going to make an impact to the community upstream and downstream of where we are. And here we go. On the left is what we call Pingree Flats in Plymouth. That's Route 100 that runs right through. And this tiny little, what looks like a dry brick down here caused all this damage. Route 100 got inundated with boulders the size of cars. It was buried, this field is buried in three, four feet of sediment. It's crazy impact um, of a very steep, tiny little stream that suddenly hits the flats and spreads out. This wasn't going to change. This was a farm field, destroyed a home, destroyed a bunch of buildings. What we did over time is we purchased what we call a river corridor easement on this property that protects it from development 
and make sure that over time, the river and the brook can do what the river and the brook need to do without us humans messing around in there. And the picture on the right is what happened in July when pretty much the exact same thing happened. Route 100 got buried in boulders, the field got buried in sediment, but what's happened over time is all of this wetland had redeveloped and that trapped the sediment. It stopped all the rubble from being distributed all over the place. There was no development in there. Nobody got harmed by it. We protected the river. We protected the people. We protected downstream because all that sediment and extra water didn't end up continuing down the river to damage properties downstream. This is Melrose Terrace, which is a, a how was a housing community for elderly and disabled folks right on the Whetstone Brook in Brattleboro. Every time there was a heavy rainstorm, they evacuated Melrose Place because they knew it could get flooded, got totally flooded, and all the buildings were flooded during Irene. And knowing that this was not a good place to rebuild and put people back in harm's way, took down almost all of the buildings, turned it back into floodplain, planted vegetation on it. And in July, the, river, the brook created an entirely new channel, but it had room to do that, which meant the water spread out, it slowed down, it dropped sediment, and right downstream from this is Brattle, the downtown Brattleboro, Vermont. So all this water got stored upstream and Brattleboro in this flood didn't get flooded. You know, we need to do this kind of stuff throughout the entire landscape. So we have these pressure valves where the water can do what the water needs to do and not impact our developed communities. And these don't all have to be great big fancy projects. This is in West Windsor and it's on Millbrook. And this was this dam was already breached. It had already fallen apart a long time ago, but this big wall part was still here. And just that, forcing the brook to go through this little narrow channel in Irene, raised the water level behind it enough to take out a beautiful historic barn here. It also forced the water like to flow straight into this bank, took out 200 feet of Harrington Road. So, you know, the infrastructure all through here, personal and public infrastructure was, was destroyed. And we didn't have to do a whole lot to fix the problem. All we did was take down the high part of the wall. Didn't cost much, but in the high water, now instead of the water being forced through a narrow slot and build up pressure like a fire hose that forced it into the bank, it spread out, it came over that wall, it continued downstream and it didn't cause any damage and it didn't cause flooding downstream in the village. You know, th there are simple things that we can do on the landscape. And th this is the road I live on. And, you know, uh, I'm, I go out and do a lot of talking and meet with a lot of people on select boards. And a lot of people are complaining that all these, these big ditches that they're building along the roads look terrible and we're gonna slide into them in winter and it's gonna be awful. And this is the right side of the road going down the hill and right after the, the big, storm on the 10th, which continued to rain afterwards. And this got a, a three times deeper um, over the next few days. But, I'm doing something, what? And this on the left-hand no, side no, of the I'm, road. I made the copy, I, I'll see what see what it's like just by resetting where the Where they put in but, that uh, rock what, line what was the thing with is held up through the entire thing for the entire month of the nightmare of July, where we had literally 20 inches of rain on this hill, this side of the road held up and there was no damage and there was no damage at the bottom. When, Marie, thank when, you so much for all the examples. If you, maybe 30 more seconds and we'll yeah, have to- Yeah, and then that's all I have. Um, you know, so, you know, when we're thinking about resilience, as I said, there's five of us. There is one, Angie Allen is the watershed planner. Oh, never mind. That's for the next 
the, the talk I'm giving on Saturday. Sorry about that. <laughs> there are five of us all around the state. Um, and so what we need to make this work is cooperation from landowners who are willing to do this on their land. We know where to go, we know what to do, and to, to basically help the community downstream and upstream, getting these projects on the ground is how resiliency kind of basically really works for the landscape and for the community. So that's my, my piece of it. Great, thank you, Marie. Um, and with that, we're going to pass off to Sam Lash. Hi, all. I'm Sam Lash, she, hers, and I'm the Climate and Energy Planner at the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission. And I saw I was able to look through participants really quickly. So this is a little, maybe somewhat of a review for some folks, but, you know, basically Vermont has county structure, but no county government. There are 11 regional planning commissions that try, at least in some regards, to fill uh, some of that gap, basically, and connecting the local, super local and the state scales by, uh, by doing a lot of this work at the regional level. Uh, and we support our member municipalities. Um, so I'm just going to dive right in. I'll try to share my screen and see if this works out. Um, here we go. That should work. All right, so this is just, uh, I, I do talk a lot and <laughs> I can go on forever. And I, I think we I really wanna honor the, the other folks that are here. So I will try to keep it short. Um, and this is just a smattering of things, but really when I was, uh, when we were talking about this and we've been talking about this a lot and thinking about this, I wanted to take a second to think about um, that I don't at all want to do away with the paradigm of resilience. It's getting a lot of traction. It's a, it's still a useful framing, um, but also that our ideal or our focus it, it's allowed to be, and I would encourage it to be thriving communities, uh, right? So we move through resilience towards a place um, where we're we're all thriving. And, and I appreciate um, that Mindy was speaking to that at the beginning. And then Marie really showed us some concrete ways um, that we can start working on that in, in, in some regards. Um, and I think um, I really keep asking myself and, and we keep asking ourselves uh, among others, um, how do we ensure that we, when we're drawing down funds or when we're focusing our investment or, or municipalities and communities are focusing their investment, uh, particularly in physical infrastructure, can we ensure that that supports our local social infrastructure as well? And so connecting the two dots between the, the two folks that already just spoke, I think is, is, a, is a really key place to also consider. I want to just take a second to realize that there are cascading impacts of, of climate change and, and also um, of, of some of the things that we've been seeing. Before the flood, we were facing a crisis of, of those who are unhoused, of extremely vulnerable residents, where everyday survival is sort of uh, the acute need. Um, and before that, we had a winter where we it was not uncommon in our region and others to have outages of over eight days, um, which impaired uh, everything from emergency to just daily functioning um, in my favorite season, winter. Um, and so I just wanted to, you know, throw a, a few things up there that we are facing increased flooding. You know, there are cascading effects of that in terms of uh, destabilization of our soils and our, you know, our um, of our some of our lands, the lack of groundwater recharge, it can contribute to droughts and dry seasons, runoff causes heavy sedimentation, we have to deal with water quality issues and with increasingly high temperatures, there's uh, blooms, uh, we also have housing issues, we have wind that's increasingly happening in the winter. I don't want to belabor the point, um, mud seasons, plural, but I also want to talk about, in addition to all of this, and I think this has already been identified, is that we are also facing, as a result of climate change, development pressure. Um, that that is a real reality for um, our state, um, and, and that there is a difference between those who are moving here out of, you know, who absolutely have to and those who are moving here because it is convenient and they have the means. And I think we're seeing patterns of dispersed infrastructure that's not necessarily investing infrastructure in our communities. And so how do we make sure we focus that and welcome folks, but welcome them into our communities and to, into supporting our communities and to making sure that that infrastructure is serving all. And we know how to do this because we already have been doing this. Um, and that's why I, you know, for the rest of my hopefully more than a few minutes, <laughs> um, 
I want to just focus on a few things that are already ongoing and a few key planning processes that your towns are currently doing or are about to do again, um, just as a, as a point of connection. And I am the climate and energy planner, so I will also focus uh, a little bit on energy and, and the role that that plays in underpinning our, our stro social structure. But um, next slide, here we go. So um, basically, just very briefly, uh, we do have a lot of ongoing processes that your municipal leadership and staff and community members and champions and folks are already engaged in. And I really just wanna encourage you to look at your town website, check to see what's on the docket, show up to meetings if you can, and have the, hold your conversations that sometimes we um, have in other spaces welcome welcome you know welcome them into public comment and and, and participate um i think that is really key capacity is a huge issue um but just really quickly you know every town has a town plan um you have local hazard mitigation plans now these are, are getting a lot of attention right now after the flooding these are done every five years and there is a robust public engagement process so i really encourage you to look out but these include risk assessments and vulnerability assessments this is where we look at mitigation strategies and where there's a list of actions that your towns put together here that they would like to do or in are intending committing to doing. Um, there is also the local emergency management plan uh, that happens every year, which just establishes lines of responsibility during a disaster. It looks at high risk populations, sites, procedures, and resources. Um, and this isn't just happening at the local level. We have uh, Vermont Emergency Management that does this at the state level. Um, our PCs, that's us, the Regional Planning Commission, support local leadership also to do these plans and, and also ensure that there's connection and communication between them. Um, and I think one of the, the big gaps and one of the most useful things is, is, for, is for folks to get involved, um, which is a huge ask. Everybody is under demand. I entirely understand that. But I just wanted to sort of give a brief highlight to some of these processes so that we don't add new ones on top of them, but instead focus together and, and try to connect and catalyze our conversations uh, in one place. Um, I did include, uh, you know, some some best practices here further on, and, and hopefully the slides can uh, provide as a re be a resource as well. Uh, I'm looking at Laura, how many minutes do I have? I, I know I do tend to be long winded. You're good. You've got four more minutes. Oh, perfect. Okay. So um, I did, I did want to just jump in and, and skip a little bit of this here to just talk a little bit about um, energy infrastructure, um, which I really view as key to um, supporting our communities. And I, and I think that it should uh, be done in a way and can be done in a way in our state that really does support our communities and our municipalities. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit uh, in a moment about the uh, community resilience hub model and how we might uh, envision that in a more rural setting. But I just wanted to give a few examples of, of why, um, I, you know, I think energy infrastructure is such a key piece of this, um, is that because we, we need it to be reliable, affordable, and, and to also have the, you know, lessen the environmental impacts of it. So, you know, for it to be renewable and efficient. Um, so that we can support warming and cooling centers, so that we can support refrigeration for food shelves. We can do that on site with generation and storage as, as a small at the community or municipal scale where possible. We can do that at libraries to support um, community wraparound services, even general stores that provide some of those services, at community centers and co-ops. Um, dispersed storage and, and generation infrastructure, you know, it, it is, is an important thing <laughs> when it comes to it comes to uh, tackling some of the challenges of rural energy infrastructure. So with those increasing wind events, like we talked about in the summer, I mean, in the winter <laughs> earlier, um, ensuring that critical facilities remain operational, not just like town garages and road crews, although those are really critical. And please always remember to also share the positive feedback with them. They're key members of our communities, but also for folks to gather if personal systems fail, right? So we need those spaces and we need those systems in place. Um, and that is the reality of Vermont is that our infrastructure is dispersed um, and it is really locally uh, specific. So looking at how are where and how are there opportunities to um, do this in a way that complements our existing lifestyles. So where are there waste heat opportunities that we can, can you know, that we can capture that waste heat and deliver it to approximate space. So we're not 
building, you know, large imposing infrastructure in other places or in and far away from where the site of where it's being uh, being used. Um, and I will point you to a lot of our, your communities have energy committees or building committees as well. Um, also working closely with conservation committees and planning commissions. Um, and so these folks are, you know, really um, being, beginning to, and many have been for a long time, thinking about how to do this in a way where we dig once. <laughs> so how do we make a comprehensive project where we can maximize the co-benefits to community? So we're looking at these uh, partnerships. We're looking at, you know, where are the opportunities to do, to either get, you know, get the next phase ready. So are you interested in um, EVs down the line or EV chargers down the line. Well, the electrical panel upgrade could be done in a current retrofit project, right? So how do we parse things out so that we can take it step by step um, and, and um, uh, one thing at a time? Um, and we know that spaces to convene and be seen are really critical to public health, especially in increasingly um, variable uh, 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 environmental conditions. So I won't uh, belabor that point, but there are some great studies, particularly on heat preparedness, and that one of the biggest factors um, for folks is, is if they have a place that they are seen regularly and, and knowing that they're okay. Basically having a place where they're seen, then they could be missed and folks will go, go check on them. So how do we make sure that those places can stay open and have lower operating costs um, and, and also make space for demand? Um, let's see. I know I've already talked a lot. So this is the uh, uh, sustainability uh, um, model uh, from Christian Baja. And these are the core components of a, of a community-led resilience hub. Um, and this was really formed in a, in a sense, in an urban setting. And so one of the things that we've been trying to do is think really hard about what would this look like in a rural space? I'm gonna, instead of going into detail here, invite you to check out the slides linked in an earlier presentation we did last year. Um, and instead sort of maybe leave up this slide of, of folks that are really taking this to heart um, and really putting this in practice, sometimes, organically and, and basically, you know, how can we push for that together uh, with more intentionality? And so I'm going to end on, I think I might have a few more seconds. Laura, give me a nod if I do. <laughs> Wrap up. Okay. Um, is basically just to ask for, uh, or basically I just wanted to highlight capacity, capacity, capacity. How do we avoid burnout um, and how do we build our capacity together? And I think one of the things that we've noticed increasingly is that there are a ton of federal programs out there. Um, but they are designed for communities in mind that have scores of departments, let alone staff in each of those departments. And that's a mismatch with what sort of what we, what you know, where we are uh, and the reality of us. So we need investment to happen and we need to foster this. So just like a, a few quick tips, if I can, uh, translate actions for your community members so that we, we it sort of serves as, as transparency and as communication education. So that could be didactic signage for something as little as we put in a heat pump, what does this do? How does this work? And what were our savings last year, right? Listen. Um, so there are previous listening sessions. There are previous plans that have ready actions that the town has already thought about, identified. Same with community groups often, previous ask lists. Go visit those before you add an additional ask. Look at co-benefits everywhere you can. And just a quick reminder, and I'll, I'll jump to my last slide and highlight the very bottom, you cannot do it all, but you do not need to. <laughs> so there are a ton, oops, sorry. There are a ton of folks out there already working on this really hard. Take a few seconds to visit some websites and let's take that energy and work together and make sure that we're coordinating and, uh, and look a few years out. Um, I will stop it there. I hope it wasn't too jump around. -y. I have tons of examples that I wanted to give, but um, yeah, 10 minutes is, is just not much, but thanks for having me. Thank you, Sam. Yes, just like in all the pre presentations so far, it's been so much information, quick, absorb it. Um, this all is recorded and the slides will be available afterwards for folks too. So with that, I wanna pass it over to Shauna Trader, the Executive Director of Rainbow Bridge Community Center. Are you with us? I'm, I'm here. Great. <laughs> Excellent. I'm here and I'm mobile. Hello, good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Sean Trader. I'm with the Rainbow Bridge Community Center. Um, I'm the ED there. And um, 
I appreciate all of this um, and this work. And I'm very blessed to be going towards the end because a lot of uh, what I have to say has been touched on by other folks. So the Rainbow Bridge has been involved with flood recovery efforts in Barrie. Uh, we've been boots on the ground, uh, canvassing work um, has done the job. And this was mentioned just a few minutes ago. Um, we get there by having been there. As in, we cannot expect to build community if we are not a part of the community. And so this was mentioned earlier by one of the speakers. We must be deeply embedded uh, was the words that they used. Thank you for that. Um, and as Sam just mentioned, we've got to get involved in a very robust way. So for instance, in Barrie, Vermont, there are probably a dozen or more than a dozen city uh, subcommittee seats open and, and vacant. Um, everyone needs to be activated. Uh, we got here through unsustainable development policy um, and behavior and thinking. And um, we have become institutionalized um, as a people and our governments, obviously, that's kind of the nature of governments as we know them. Um, but as discussed, resiliency is something about flexibility, uh, being limber. And to be limber, we must undo the things in our minds and in our hearts that have caused us to be so static and anti-human. Um, so this, um, I realize this is a little bit different from everyone else, so maybe it's a break from all the facts. Um, but um, we essentially need to, so what? I, for instance, what, I'm, what I heard from Marie um, with the water work is that um, we, resiliency meant returning our spaces to the way that they were prior to our unsustainable development. And so something has happened. Um, we could call it colonization, um, but as Fanon has said, it's in the mind and it's in the heart and it has to do with the binary, it has to do with not realizing the connections that are inherent in all people and therefore all life on earth. Um, so that division, that proclivity for people to see something and define something um, as me versus other or or some or some kind of division that underlies the work that we're doing um, when we talk about building communities and for the rainbow bridge community center and for the rainbow response team that was activated after the flood the antidote to that is to be where people are, uh, meet them where they are, do what they do, um, get dirty with them, um, muck, be a part of it um, in a very visceral and very grassroots way um, because you can create community without even using words when we act in a way that is human-centered. So when we go out there and we just show up with a shovel, we muck and we work and we sweat. And when it's over, we hug, we cry, we talk. And every time we add someone to our circle, um, that plus one, that plus one is a block, a building block of community. We repeat that work broadly, and we have a model of community on a person-by-person -person basis that can grow sustainably um, and with heart 
in a way that works for people, even people that may be reluctant at first to form community or to communicate with you. But it has to do with having been there. And that ties into our policy and our leaders. We must have representation that represents us. Um, many people in Barry, even before the flood, and obviously we know that's exacerbated now, struggled with all of these issues that we're discussing, housing, keeping the lights on, food, water, the basics of life, which we have been told from a young age are what humans need to live, food, water, and shelter. And yet everywhere we look, it is harder and harder to access those three things. So for all of the pain and suffering that exists for largely poor people in Vermont, I would ask how many of our leaders, how many of our politicians have experienced that as well? Um, how many have been homeless? How many have lived out of a bag of coins or been evicted or been addicted to, uh, addicted to drugs, struggled on a everyday and yearly basis because we know that experience is the best teacher and a great source of wisdom and a great empathy builder. Um, but it's not necessarily the only thing. Um, first of all, our leaders and our people, we can experience that by doing what I just described a few minutes ago, going there and being there. Um, and if we can't do it that way, we can do it by proxy, by listening, and by making sure that people are safe enough to speak. Um, we have to speak and we have to listen. Um, and then we have to act. <laughs> so we have the, there is always a, a body, mind, heart, and soul. So the government, for instance, our governments may have the bones, it may have the structure, but it has no heart and it has no soul. Um, the people have the power. We are the muscle, we are the flesh, we make it work. Um, and we also bring to the table the spirit um, that is necessary to build empathy, build community, build capacity. We don't talk enough about love in these situations. So thank you for giving me the opportunity uh, because it seems like it's a forbidden word in politics. And yet through love, we can build policy and we can change behaviors and thoughts and words um, in a very human-centered way. And I'm not sure that it's possible to get there in a clinical and scientific and sterile way. Uh, without love, uh, we can do lots of things, um, but can we do it sustainably? And can we reach our most vulnerable people if we don't care deeply enough? So get involved, and if you're a leader, if you're a politician, you better be out there in the field working with the people, because uh, if you haven't been there before, you need to get there, and you need to have that understanding um, so that you can do what you need to do. And on our end, on the nonprofit side of things, we have the power to facilitate heart and care in our communities in a way that the governments cannot. Um, and it's important to say, as someone else mentioned earlier, that, you know, this level of change that we're discussing requires bottom to top, top to bottom, inside to out, government, nonprofits, people, environment. <laughs> we won't get there. We won't get what we want if that change isn't robust because 
community, healthy community, is robust and incredibly diverse. Um, we know that there is not a sustainable, successful monoculture on earth. We require diversity to live and to thrive, especially. <laughs> um, and without that robust network of connections that diversity provides, we will not be supported enough to do it. And I think Sam just mentioned before I came on that um, it's the connections that make the difference. Um, community is commitment and it's connection in a way that um, uplifts people um, when they're down and keeps them from drowning. Um, none of us can do it by ourselves, um, but we know that our power grows exponentially every time we add that plus one. So we have um, a great opportunity in that. Um, we've got to listen, not just to the people, but to the land and the water as well. So we won't go into it now, but we're kind of talking about decolonization of the mind and of the heart. Um, we have to listen to our land, our water, and our people. There is no human wellness without environmental wellness, and there's no healing without listening and then working. Is that my 10 minutes? Thank you. Thank you, yes. John. Yeah, Thank you so for, much. For bringing in that, that piece of love and that individual connection to build that that dialogue, that capacity to grow together. So thank you so much. We'll stay on here for the next half hour. Um, we'll pause if folks need to run to an 11 o'clock. Um, thanks for joining us. And the next half hour is really a question and answer time for folks. So um, feel free to put your questions in the chat, as well as I think we're a small enough group. Uh, we can also raise your virtual hand um, so that you're seen on the screen. Um, and we will kind of moderate that, that conversation together as a collective community here today. All right, so with that, um, Jan Van Eyck, it looks like your hand is up and feel free to come off mic and ask your question. Well, I'd like to make a comment. Um, the, the, the general comment is that there's been a series of suggestions that the building land in the communities along the floodplains should be effectively abandoned and property should be rebuilt uh, on higher ground. Um, I think this is a bit short-sighted, the number of reasons I say this. Uh, first, it's entirely possible to build on floodplain land uh, and have the property remain totally dry. I'll get into the engineering aspects of that in a second. But uh, realistically, the uh, rural parts of Vermont are built in valleys You've got a stream or a river running down the valley. Then you have steep-sided uh, terrain to each side of the town. Uh, so uh, unless you're proposing to build cliff-hanging buildings, dwellings hanging off the side of mountains, it's just not practical to think in terms of moving uh, any large quantity of either residences or commercial buildings onto mountain sides. And I certainly don't propose that the mountain top should be removed and made level so that you can build on top of mountains. I think that's silly. So you're pretty much stuck with the current uh, terrain format, which is where you have a narrow valley and you have a cluster of towns built along that valley. And you're not going to be able to abandon that land unless you abandon the towns. Now there are movements afoot 
where everybody should be moved off the rural land in Vermont. I think that's a bit silly. Uh, I don't propose that at all. So the real question is, can you build in a floodplain so that if the river or when the river floods, that the property itself is not damaged? And yes, of course you can. That's purely an engineering consideration. It is entirely possible to build private homes or to rebuild existing homes. It requires jacking up the home and constructing a new foundation underneath and then lowering the home back onto the new foundation. When you can John, build a do home. You, I appreciate the, the insight that you bring to the conversation. If you have questions for our panelists and or maybe one more thought, and then we want to make sure that others have time to speak to, because it is going to, going to be a short amount of time today. No, I don't have a question for the, for the panel other than to say, why would you want to abandon the land? Uh, because financially speaking, I think that's going to become hugely burdensome, and it's also going to constrain the communities. So the real aspect of it is to be able to utilize the current floodplain land to build buildings on which will remain completely resilient to any flood of any conceivable depth all right well, thank depth, you I say thank you for feet. your comments Jan. i think we're gonna um shift on to see some of the other questions that have come up but with point noted that there's opportunities to think creatively in floodplain development areas um, one question that came in the chat for marie but you would love um, to know a little bit more about what other states like Massachusetts are doing to um, update the mapping work that's being done and what could this model look like uh, going forwards in Vermont? As I said, I think some, some of the work being done is in Massachusetts is being done by, by industry um, because they have that investment. I know some of the state our state is working on on updating our floodplain maps. We've been DEC has been in touch with FEMA about um, the need for this. FEMA does it on a rotating basis around the entire country, um, so it's not something that tends to happen very quickly. But um, I know our the DEC folks are in communication with them about the need for that to happen quicker because of the situation that we're in. I don't know where that conversation will go, um, but that's certainly been the state's request to FEMA. And, and there are other opportunities um, more on a, on a local basis um, where some of that work is being done regionally. We've there been in discussions about mapping our alluvial fans. That first picture I showed about Pingree Flats, and that's where the water comes straight down a mountain and hits the flats. And where can how can we get those areas, even those most hazardous locations, mapped so people are aware of them, so they 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 don't put themselves in harm's way. So there's a lot of work being done in the backgrounds um, by by state, by FEMA, and by other other entities who have an interest in making sure we're not damaged by it. Thanks. Um, hand raised by Di is a Diane Gips. Hi. Um, regarding what Mindy, I believe, was talking about uh, with food hubs, is there any real reason to not strongly encourage people to grow their own food? I don't know if Vermont has any laws about not growing in your front yard or whatever that that nonsense is, but I know other areas they've lived have. Um, providing information, providing resources, maybe some incentives. The more food somebody can grow on their own property, the bigger their buffer is against food, food availability being compromised or rising food prices. So real efforts put into, okay, grow your tomato plant in a container this year. Maybe next year you want to expand it into a bunch of containers. Maybe the year after you want to put something on your property or somebody can jump in both feet together and put up a, a, a huge garden plot, but they need resources, they need help, they need support, they need encouragement, they need to be told, this is something that you can do. And I'm wondering if being new to the area, there are downsides to that that I'm not seeing. Love the question, what a great question. Um, and I totally agree with you that um, growing 
food in the places where we live is essential and and it's just um and it's not just important to feed us but also for the pollinators and the ecosystem health and and all of it and being at forming relationships with the land all of that is essential and there are a lot of people who don't have access to land, who live in apartment buildings, who are houseless, who live in all sorts of dis different situations and don't necessarily have that type of access themselves. So I've seen the Vermont Community Garden Network doing really great work around helping communities of people create community garden spaces. So that's one um, one tangible example of an organization that's helping people do that and people who don't have access just in there, they don't have a backyard. Right, right. Um, and so, you know, so land access is such a key aspect of our ability to be resilient, right? Like to, you know, whether we can go in our pantry and, and get some things that we've preserved and grown and use that versus going to a grocery store for instance, during the pandemic when shelves were empty sometimes, you know, um, and and just the levels of resilience and access and ability to access that. But I 100% agree with you about using our local spaces to be growing food and for our communities and to trade that. We also don't have to grow everything ourselves, right? And it's like, right. I can have chickens and I can trade my eggs and somebody else will have vegetables and I don't love preserving vegetables. And so, you know, I can, we can, we can engage in that trade and that's community building too. So even somebody wants to grow on their own property and somebody in an apartment can do the preserving and they can share the, the, the bounty between them, but I'm not seeing a lot of push towards, I mean, I'm going to look into that community garden network that you were talking about. I'm on the select board of my town. I'm really concerned about the resilience of my town, which is why I'm here. But I'm not seeing the push I would love to see about, okay, back to the victory garden concept, back to growing in your own property. Um, take responsibility for yourself in a way that we used to do. The more we can do for ourselves, the less vulnerable we are when disaster hits. I'd love to add if that's okay. Um, I, mean, I want to give you a chance, obviously, if you or were you. Okay. Um, just wanted to point out Regeneration Corps um, that also works with the Healthy Soil Coalition. They do a ton of work in this space, especially around um, youth and community garden spaces. I also want to really draw attention to a lot of the health equity work, um, some of which the RPCs have been involved with, but also in close collaboration with the Vermont Department of Health and some of our wraparound uh, sort of backbone public health organizations. So there's health equity, um, uh, assistance, technical assistance pilot. A lot of that was focused on food access, including really focused around uh, community space for growing and also storing food is really key here. Um, and so uh, a lot of the um, uh, food shelves and food pantries around our, um, and I'll, I'll speak from my experience in Central Vermont, are informal. Um, we have a wonderful food bank um, that is also very active, but a lot of the other ones are informal. They're operated often at the town level, um, often in, in cooperation with an interface space, with uh, sometimes the town garage. Um, sometimes the fire department, um, and, and they can vary quite a lot. And they, they do rely fundamentally on folks who are usually growing either as a part down, part time or secondary part of their income or just independently. And so one of the reasons you may not um, necessarily see it uh, is, is because it's, it's very much in, in, uh, sort of integrated into the fabric of, of who our towns are and, and residents are. And also really wanted to highlight the gleaning programs. We have the Central Vermont uh, gleaning program. There's the uh, Lamoille County gleaning program. There's uh, quite a few others. Some of those are in partner with conservation districts. Some of them are independent or, or, or have other affiliations, but um, these are, are critical spaces. And, and I'll just put the plug in, especially around food storage. Let's think about energy efficiency, getting those applied clients yes. updated and making sure that they're reliable and we're not getting waste. So I'll just like go down. Yes, exactly. So wherever <laughs> we can pair those with a critical facility that will have on-site generation and storage, I'll go to my book. So I just want to Thank add you. that in. Thank you both. Great. Thank you. And um, Mindy's putting some of the links in the chat. We'll also sort of build those resources to post after, after the work fact too. Um, so a question from Bonnie here. Would the panelists discuss what they see as the role of resilience advocates in the local uh, and of local governments? And what where are examples of effective advocate government partnerships that build thriving communities? And what is recommended as best practices to build these partnerships? 
Sean, do you want to uh, yeah. take no, that one say, first? I can speak. <laughs> That'd be great. The role of local um, advocates is to listen, as we said. Um, we know that our leaders, our politicians, are cannot get out there usually. They, they have a lot of high-level work to do. But if there's an advocate in the community for resilience, they should be with our most vulnerable people, listening to them and taking those words straight to city council and getting involved in those committees and everything else. Just show up, show up, show up, listen, and then speak. I can jump in here too, just briefly, um, and share an example of a piece of legislation that passed um, that was really a unique organizing attempt that started in 2020 and a group of a group of frontline activists um, and community organizers got together to draft this legislation called the um, the Vermont BIPOC led land access and opportunity act and that legislation ended up and and that was that was through a partnership there was a legislator as part of that crew of people organizing and advocating for this legislation um, and was also a really grassroots effort but it was a really interesting example of like kind of public private partnership in developing legislation. And that legislation ended up being rolled into um, a, a housing bill in 2022. And now it exists as the Land Access and Opportunity Boards. I'm gonna share that link too. But that was just a, a really positive example of a big legislation moving through that was really community member led in support um, is supported by a legislator. I was going to add um, two things. Uh, I think what what makes it work best. I was going to say learning publicly that acceptance to learn publicly and uh, and, and to listen. Um, and part of that means taking a breath before we react. Um, uh, and, and sort of really holding a space for others to um, to engage and and. Uh, and taking the time to be transparent and explain, which is tough, but really critical. Uh, I was going to say uh, mentorship. We um, really have had a wave um, in sort of across government, across um, nonprofits and across advocates and, and, and public supporting. And then also, you know, in, in local champions, a wave of turnover. Um, and there's a big sort of gap. And so I think we really need to... Uh, uh, start proactively addressing that by providing mentorship opportunities by in making sure that we incorporate yeah. that the time and the budget for mentorship, which is also community engagement, right? It's in building relationships and making sure that relationships between folks isn't um, sort of uh, shucked off and put on a temporary um, temporary person or, or somebody who's only fulfilling a role for a short amount of time, but those are deep sort of deep bonds. I want to say that um, we have a, a several series of energy coordinators and energy committees, some of which are are sort of very organized together, some of which are, are sort of very um, independent, some are town appointed, some are ad hoc and sort of adjacent to the town. Um, and it's been a really interesting model and a really and, and it has proven to be really locally adaptable and flexible. And I would say that the one the times that that works best is when um, uh, uh, understanding the structures that already exist, go to a few select board meetings, <laughs> understand the, the the amount of stuff that's coming in, understand the the yearly sort of budgeting system and, or the or the time restraint and requirements, understanding the the requirements that exist, not necessarily because that's what should be sort of domineering and dominant over like acute needs or or cooperation or anything like that. I'm not suggesting that, but just so that you can just get the perspective of where other people are coming from. And so I think, yeah, giving that benefit of the doubt and 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 sort of taking up that public comment space too in a respectful way and also point out when things are good. <laughs> that doesn't hurt. Um, and so I, yeah, I just, I would say, again, it's super hard and I think it's a frustrating thing and I'm frustrated when I hear it, but I'm going to say it anyways, is finding that, finding the time and space to show up. Um, and And if you can't, being honest about that and encouraging others too. And, and I'll just jump in really quickly as, as part of the government. 
and being in that role, you know, th there are a lot of roles that that government plays and there's the legislative role and there's the regulatory role. And then there's there's a lot of us who are out there um, with just technical assistance and information and, and are, are actually there. I'm from the government and I'm there to help. <laughs> you know, there, there are there are those of us out there. Um, and you know, the question on, on, on what are those partnerships uh, for advocacy? And one of the things that I, I most appreciate about the work that, that I get to do in watershed planning is partnering with all the local organizations, right? We partner with all the watershed groups around the state. We partner with natural resource conservation districts. We partner a lot with the RPCs. You know, and we have these relationships where where we share the information, but we also share the funding. And I think that's where a lot of the advocacy comes from is because we're we're in really close contact. We know what each other's are doing. They understand what the state is doing, what our goals are, and what the needs are. And you know, as a state employee, we are not advocates. We we don't play that role, but our partners do. And and I I always so appreciate when our partners are vocal about what the local needs are to to the other entities um, that are that are more in control of that. So th those partnerships and and just having those relationships with the local community, whether or not it's a region or a town planning commission or a local watershed group that works on Millbrook, you know, all of those relationships and partnerships are really key to, to getting the information and getting the work done on the ground and getting the information to the people who can really make that difference. Great, thanks Marie. That was back to Sean's comment of the top top and bottom and bottom and top kind of how to work work it all together um, to really make that impact happen. Um, one more question that came in is what is being done to help the domestic violence victims during all the chaos caused by the flooding? Um, I will uh, quickly say that um, well, we are in a sort of a plan planning mode, so where you tend to be that long term, how do we, um, how do we uh, uh, sort of address some of the like longer term systemic issues, um, uh, and therefore we aren't usually jumping into um, address acute needs. Um, we are uh, in close cooperation with our Thrive partners. Thrive is like the Barry District, which Central Vermont um, sort of public health backbone group, um, and that includes uh, Capstone Community Agency, a Community Action Agency, um, Good Samaritan, United Way of Green Mountain, uh, CVHSS, um, Recovery Vermont, Turning Point, Downstreet, et cetera. So there's a bunch of folks that are all um, really focused, and I do know that quite a few of them have been active, including with um, uh, 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 DV folks. And so I, I do, I, I'm, I'm happy to provide some connections there. I, I can't speak to all of that work necessarily directly, but I do know that those networks have been um, extremely active coordinating actually uh, three days a week for a 20 minute call in the morning to check on everything from sort of broad scale, what's going on, where, where does there need to be funding coordination to actually discrete individual needs. So, um, I, you know, happy to, to connect uh, you to some of those resources. And then also, I will always say that um, there are a bunch of folks that have really good community facing um, sort of resources. I will call out VLCT in terms of especially focused on, from the municipal perspective, but then also uh, they do often include links to, to others um, sort of, and the Vermont Department of Health has excellent ones, including for all the supporting agencies. So I just wanted to flag that. Thanks, Sam. There was a comment too about the the terminology of the climate migration and infrastructure projects, um, and I think it 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 does come down to that education, but communication, and that there's so much um, of our current population that doesn't have access to that infrastructure and housing, and um, so it is a mixed a mixed piece of the entire kind of look at how. Vermont is positioned to to receive more um, 
more population, yet at the same time, not adequately addressing the needs of current populations too. And I was wondering if any of the, the panelists want to speak to that, that kind of dichotomy of thought that is coming up when we're talking about development. I can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, well, in the language around immigration, I mean, people are xenophobic. People are really xenophobic, and that is a reality. And people are, and, and racism and xenophobia often get mixed together. Um, but people everywhere, like people in a lot of places, are xenophobic. But people in Vermont are really xenophobic um, in in being afraid of and not wanting like people like outside people coming in or like urban populations is like something that I hear often. And on one hand, I'm like I just want to be able to actually name what's true and real and name immigration and name migration and name these different aspects. And there are different ways to communicate all of that in different communities at different times. Um, and I think that when we're stuck and not being able to actually name the thing and when we cloak it in local improvement instead of talking about migration specifically, some things get missed and missed in translation. And and I think that there are also useful strategies in, in not naming the thing so specifically sometimes. Um, and so, you know, I think that comment to me landed as like a language language comment. Um, and and there there is a lot to navigate in that. And there is a there is a major dichotomy around people who are living in Ver people who are existing in Vermont, people who don't feel like their basic human needs are met here to be thinking about like, you know, programs to accept to like bring people from other places or open the doors to other people. They're like, no, like meet our needs first. And that's so real. And we do have to be needing meeting the basic human needs of people here now. And that is part of the work is designing systems that can hold both meeting needs of people now and also not closing doors. And I think we have a lot of work to do in being able to actually name the things and name the things coming up and talk about them precisely. Um, and and there are all sorts of different strategies that we have to use in communicating this information in different communities. So thanks for that, that comment. I just wanted to quickly add and sort of a flip, a flip side and, and I, you know, agree with everything said, but the, the flip side, side is also the reality that in some of the other parts of the states, um, there's, there is an ideal of Vermont and sometimes folks do, both who live here and, and oftentimes folks who are who are are moving to Vermont have an ideal that they do feel entitled to versus the reality of of where communities are trying to go to support um to support their communities for uh, in terms of thriving and and I say this in the sense of um uh ensuring that again that that physical investment that physical infrastructure that's going in um we are i think we are starting to see um towns grappling with how do we ensure or sort of encourage that to be shared um and, and so i think it's uh um talking about a very different um supporting a very different uh type of development and it's different folks that that that's in sort of reference to but i, I do think that's a key thing to keep in mind and then also there was a time, you know, when you, you get used to infrastructure to a certain extent. I'm not, I'm not at all saying that we wanted to, you know, we want to radically change what's here. I, I grew up here. I love it here. Um, and then that's not what I'm advocating for, but um, there is infrastructure in place. We are dominated by roads with, you know, overhead wires. We're, you know, with gas stations, et cetera. And, and that is infrastructure. And so I think sometimes we also just have to sort of, um, look around and say like, is this working for us? And what and what could it look like different? And, and allow ourselves the space to reimagine. Um, and I think that's that's the key takeaway, I hope. Great, thanks. I think that is a great place to end of this reimagine and how to think through the opportunities that arise, how to connect one-on-one -on -one and also show up, like Sean kept saying, show up, show up. Um, be in community together and 
Um, I know there are a few more questions coming in, but we're going to stop here at 1130 and thank you all for participating. Thank you to the panel for sharing your insights and the opportunity to start this conversation together around community resilience here in Vermont. So, thank you all. Have a good rest of your day.